Um, Ambassador Gallucci, there's all sorts of things I could single out <laughs> about your uh, uh, career. <laughs> yeah, He's currently the uh, Distinguished Professor of Diplomacy at Georgetown University, and this builds on a whole ream of really impressive appointments in and outside of government. I'm just going to cherry pick two. Uh, one of the, this is he led, he was Chief nego US Negotiator uh, in the... Uh, 1994 negotiations between the US and North Korea, uh, which is really iconic in my head because it moved the world from a situation uh, fraught with high confrontation to one that was typified by cooperation. Uh, and um, immediately before that, he was Deputy Executive Chairman of the United Nations Special Commission, which oversaw the verified disarmament of Iraq following the Gulf War. So he's been there. As well as studying things from an academic perspective, he's had hands-on experience, and it'll be very interesting to hear his comments now. Thank you very much. I'm going to go there. Great. So um, if I were going to give the theme for my remarks, it, it really would be something like international security and nuclear weapons, they're back. Um, and what I hope to do in, in a few minutes here is talk about quickly an overview from 30,000 feet of where we've come and how we think about nuclear weapons over the last four decades or five decades. What's happening these days? Um, and, and finish with a perspective on what at least the United States of America thinks now ought to be done about what's happening with nuclear weapons around the world. So the first decade, 1950s, uh, was a period in which the United States, for those who were witting about things, discovered that we were, for the first time in our history as a country, not a very long history, but a history, first time we were defenseless, that the United States of America had no defense. And we'd been accustomed to having a, a defense since about 1814 when, I don't mean to bring up bad thoughts, when the British were rude enough to burn Washington. And subsequent to that, until 1945-ish, that period, the United States could mount a defense. Actually, the way the strategist uses the word defense, which means defense by denial, could deny people access to the United States of America. All of a sudden, with the introduction thanks to the Germans in Germany of the V2 and the Germans in the United States, creation of nuclear weapons, put these two things together, one weapon, one bomb, one city, no way of stopping an incoming intercontinental ballistic missile. We had no way of stopping them in 1945, nor do we in 2019, actually. So all of a sudden, the first point to make about this period of nuclear weapons is that there is no defense. The second point is nuclear weapons got very big. If you think of Hiroshima and Nagasaki as being in the kiloton, thousands of tons of TNT equivalent, and usually Hiroshima is thought to be about 10,000 tons or 15,000 tons, Nagasaki about 20,000 tons of TNT equivalent. By the time we get into the real first decade of the 50s, we have gone to 100 times that size for the nominal thermonuclear weapon of a megaton or more of yield, which is very much larger than what were considered city busters at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Also in the 1950s, we were trying to figure out what nuclear weapons were good for in terms of, for Americans, American defense. And it meant not only continental defense, but defense of Europe and our allies. Our first instinct was to make them good for everything. So we figured, we've heard the phrase, massive retaliation. Someone is doing something we don't like, we threaten them with these massive nuclear weapons. And we rapidly figured out when we were ignored that this doesn't work, that we were not, and here's a key word for the world we live in, credible. We were not credible to use thermonuclear weapons to deal with the Vietnamese who had surrounded the French at Dien Bien Phu. It, it, that's no way to intervene. So we, we understood we needed 
other means. And nuclear weapons had to be good for something. And what we figured they must be good for is for the concept that we had used to replace defense. Since I said to you defense was gone, the concept to replace defense was deterrence. And we started to come to a more textured view in the 1950s of what deterrence meant. The first thing deterrence meant was that one needed to have a capability to punish, that that was the essence of deterrence. The phrase will ne never be uttered by a strategist that a good defense is a deterrent. No, deterrence purely for the strategist is punishment. If you propose to deter me, not defend against me, you are going to get whacked by me if your deterrent fails. And then your deterrent threat was to whack me back, so now I am sorry I whacked you. But it's punishment. It's, there is no denial in deterrence. And so the first sophisticated appreciation for the implications uh, of deterrence was its delicacy, a wonderful piece sort of written by Albert Wilstedt in 1957 the delicate balance of terror. There was this odd theory that deterrence was like two scorpions in a bottle. It is not like that. The delicate balance of terror means that the stability of the deterrent relationship, the, the effectiveness of your deterrent, depends upon your ability to survive an attack and still punish. So it depends on your, what the strategists call, second strike capability. Doesn't matter what your first strike capability is, if it's vulnerable to being destroyed, you don't have a deterrent, or you don't have a deterrent you should rely on. So the delicate balance of terror, and that told us something, and we developed a triad. And the triad has been developed subsequently by the Soviets, now the Russians, and the Chinese, and if you look around at new nuclear weapon states, like, for example, Pakistan, India, and North Korea, they're moving in that direction too. So you have land-based systems, you have aircraft, you have missiles that are fixed, you have missiles that are mobile, you have missiles at sea. So you have these various ways of delivering nuclear weapons in order that you meet the critique of the delicacy of the balance of terror. So that's how we finish the first decade. We go into the second decade and we recognize something else about deterrence. It's entirely psychological, unlike defense. Defense, if I want to defend against your attack, I don't need to think about what you're thinking about. If I have an adequate defense, attack me. It'll be adequate. If it's inadequate, I don't have to worry about what you're thinking about. You will, you'll prevail. In deterrence, it all depends on what you're thinking. I may have no deterrent, but if you think I do, you're deterred. Right? If you don't think I do have a deterrent, but I do, I'm dead. So deterrence entirely is psychological. <laughs> If deterrence is delicate, it's also irrelevant if the person you propose to deter values your death more than his life, right? Or he's somehow otherwise prevented from rationality. So when we started thinking about the proliferation of nuclear weapons to new states and we worried maybe they wouldn't be as rational as we were presuming the Soviets were, Lord help us. And the people we were most worried about at that point in the were the Chinese. So we were developing, therefore, a defense, we said. We we're going to have a real defense against attack. So we moved from deterrence to defense. And we held on to that for a good five years. Right? And we deployed these systems, Sentinel and Safeguard, two missiles. One missile goes up exo-atmospherically, the other proximate. And they all were designed to shoot down missiles as they came over the pole from the Soviet Union to attack the United States. And when you looked at the view graphs, which we had in those days, these arrows going back and forth looked terrific. Americans loved this and this. The Canadians were not so hot on the idea. But to us, it looked terrific. The only problem is it only worked in the view graphs. We actually couldn't shoot down these missiles. So we were pretty enthusiastic about doing something about this because, A, we couldn't have a defense. So we were back to deterrence. And B, defense was pernicious because it only led to greater offense to overcome the defense. And greater offense to overcome the defense, the offense would always win because of something called the offense-defense cost exchange ratio. An increment of offense is cheaper than an increment of defense. So we went into the 1970s back to deterrence, the third decade, we went into the 1970s back to deterrence, enthusiastic about creating stability, so arms control, SALT one, 
and also banning defense, which was destabilizing, hence the ABM Treaty. So that was the 70s. However, we live in a state of nature, and we don't trust this. So we build, and they build, and we build, and they build. So by the time we get to the next decade, right, which is now we're, we're moving here to the fourth decade, we are both building a lot. So what does a lot mean? Ooh, if you took the numbers at like 1982, 1983, we deployed around 31,000 nuclear weapons, warheads, counting, countable warheads. The, the Soviets did about the same. So together, we deployed about a little over 60,000 nuclear weapons. Now, I just did a little calculation uh, on current urban figures. If you had seven thermonuclear weapons, nominal yield, two megatons, and attacked America's seven largest urban centers, you could kill 20% of the American population. That's about 60 million people. And, and this is prompt. And, and, and the, this stuff, you have prompt deaths and you have protracted prompt. Prompt is from the first second on to about three to five days. So you, you need seven to destroy one in five people in the United States. We were, had together deployed 60,000. So you, you get a concept of overkill here. This is where that word came from. So at that point, while we had talked about defense again, we, the United States began to think about defense again, and, and we discovered something which is you can sell anything to a president. And one thing that was sold was Star Wars, or the Strategic Defense Initiative. And those of, those of you who were alive uh, in the 1980s may recall the enthusiasm for Star Wars, or for the Strategic Defense Initiative, not the movie. And the idea was, through some new physical principles, and very often lasers were involved, some was space-based, some was terrestrial, but we could defend the United States of America we couldn't, you understand. We never de deployed a speck of this technology. But the Soviets were petrified. I mean, petrified by the idea that since we were relying on mutual vulnerability, mutual assured destruction, we had embraced vulnerability, we were in a deterrent world, we were going to deploy a defense which denied them the method of achieving their security. So they built and built and built more to overcome something we didn't have. A colleague of mine said it was a great decade. We deployed view graphs. They deployed SS-18s to overcome our view graphs. Fortunately for everybody, the Soviet Union collapsed, and we moved into the next decade. The next decade was kind of a happy decade in my little story here. Um, U.S. and Russian, I was talking to David Hanna before, U.S. and Russian cooperation never was as good as it was in the, in the certainly the early Yeltsin years, even all the Yeltsin years, uh, before or since. And U.S.-Russian relations were excellent. We cooperated in all kinds of ways. Um, we celebrated the end of history. You may recall that, you know, the Hegelian process. And out of all this Hegelian movement of the means of governance, liberal democracies were going to prevail around the world forever. We discovered globalization, and nation state was going to wither away. You may remember about that, too. These things actually didn't happen. but. It, it, it was a thought. Um, and we embraced not only negotiated arms control aimed at stability, but we also embraced de facto, virtually unilateral disarmament. Remember those high level 60 some thousand nuclear weapons? We, we dumped, we and the, and the Russians dumped over 80% of those weapons, most of that unilaterally. I mean, we were watching what the other side was doing, and they were. But that was an incredible reduction down to something in the 5,000, 6,000 range for both sides. Even proliferation, which was a major concern, was not so bad. I mean, we, we were aware of proliferation in South Asia, India, and Pakistan, but they weren't, didn't seem to be moving anywhere in the 90s. We were aware of the Middle East, but didn't seem to be, nothing seemed to be happening in the Middle East. Iraq, we fought a war and disarmed them. I was on the ground leading inspections in Iraq. David Hanna was at the, at the United Nations at the time. 
and it was pretty successful. We, we took that program apart. In Northeast Asia, there was a deal done with North Korea that I had something to do with, very good. We thought it was good anyway. Okay. Remarkably, also during this period, we had rollback. And for what Dan is going to talk about, scrap, it's important to recognize we've had rollback, that there were three states of the former Soviet Union that had nuclear weapons on their territory, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, and Belarus, and all three gave up their nuclear weapons at Lisbon. And South Africa had six nuclear weapons, gave those up. Okay, circumstances, special and all that, but we had not only, it appeared, a stable position on proliferation, but we actually enjoyed rollback. Relevant, I think, to what we're about to talk about. In the next decade, the 2000s or the aughts, as it's sometimes known, America comes to understand terrorism in a new way as we are hit, and we understand nuclear weapons in a new way as we put these two circles together into a Venn diagram and make nuclear terrorism out of it, and we start seeing our vulnerability without a defense, because we can't defend our borders, and without a deterrent, because we not, not only might we be attacked by people who don't care about being attacked back, but we may not know exactly who did it. And if we can find out who did it, they may not live anywhere in particular. Right? So no defense, no deterrent, nuclear terrorism, very bad. Vulnerability. And then India and Pakistan, they begin to engage in what we would call an arms race, a, a genuine nuclear arms race. And then there's Iran, and Iran is revealed to have a rather robust nuclear weapons program, embracing not only enrichment for highly enriched uranium, but, you know, a... a a track, heavy water moderated reactor to produce plutonium for a plutonium track. Not only that, but we have a president who starts off his administration by abrogating the ABM treaty and the constraints on defense are offed. And not only that, but we're sort of back to the Star Wars situation in which the United States is talking about two things it has fallen in love with. One, the idea of defense, again, without any defense. And the idea of something that's also spooky to the Russians and the Chinese, and it's sometimes called prompt global strike, sometimes conventional prompt global, global strike. And it means the American capability to strike any target on the Earth within 24 hours. Now, we also don't have that capability, but it's something we talk about. So both defense and the idea that we could launch a disarming first strike is truly threatening to the security of both Russia and China. So if you look at what we have in our decade, we have a U.S.-Russian relationship, which is quite bad. I would say that we, the United States, has looked at what the Russia did, Russians did in Georgia in Ukraine, Crimea, uh, and what it does, not with invasion, but activities in the Baltics, and we are not amused. We have looked at the, what they did to us in the 2016 elections, and before you point out that the Americans have messed in other people's elections before, I know that. That doesn't stop us from being outraged at what the Russians did to us. If you look at Putin's speech in March of 2018, it is extraordinary. I just did that recently, and the whole thing, and he's talked about these mega torpedoes to attack uh, cities on the coast of the United States with nuclear weapons. He talks about nuclear-powered cruise missiles that fly all over the world over both poles before they attack something. He talks about um, uh, hypersonic glide vehicles uh, and no way of intercepting these with your ballistic missile defense system. Little does he apparently know, we don't have a ballistic missile defense system. Yes, we have deployed some launchers at Vandenberg Air Force Base and in Alaska, but very few, and they can't hit much. Even if you tell them when the target's coming and that there are no decoys, it still doesn't hit it. So once again, the Russians are reacting to our declaratory policy, our wish list. At the same time, the United States has, along with, I'd say, the Russians and the Chinese, embraced activity which is objectively, from the criteria of the strategist, embracing instability. 
any time you develop capabilities that are designed, at least in part, to destroy command and control by the other side, you are attempting to mess with their capability to control the use of their forces. So when we deploy and they deploy cyber and counter space activity, we are both messing with our ability to secure a strategic balance. We are attacking stability, and that's what we're doing. The United States has done the things that have made headlines with its withdrawal from the INF Treaty for what I would regard as a technical violation, a violation, but a technical violation by the Russians. Um, the Chinese are doing very interesting things in, in the um, South and East China Seas. They are really working on the tai Taiwan scenario with anti-access and area denial technologies. Um, at the same time as we look around the world at the Chinese, U.S., and the Russian-U.S. relationship is getting more fraught, we see the fastest growing nuclear weapons program on the planet right now in Pakistan. And the Indians are moving to match it. North Korea has developed a very robust capability over the years so that it is on the edge, if not over the edge, of being able to put a thermonuclear weapon on an American city. And remember, we have no real defense, only deterrence, which is why you have the President of the United States flying around the world for meetings that don't actually work. And with this all, we have the reality of U.S. policy to deal with Tehran. We had kind of a little respite with the JCPOA, but this president has decided he can do better. There is, on top of all this, still some enthusiasm for the use of plutonium and nuclear fuels for commercial nuclear power. This enthusiasm exists in Russia, some in India, some in, in Japan, certainly in China, and still in France. This is regrettable if you care about nuclear terrorism. And then there's the American response, the so-called nuclear posture review. And there are more than one document, but this is my favorite. came out in March of last year. And it has the United States building the following, a new set of SSBNs, of submarines that carry our ballistic missiles, of virtually new land-based missiles, Minuteman three, a new air-launched cruise missile to put aboard our standoff bomber, still the B-52, a new penetrating bomber to replace the B-2, the flying wing, new uh, dual-capable fighter aircraft to replace the F-15, new sea-launched cruise missiles, again with nuclear weapons, which we had abandoned nine years ago, and something brand new, which is to put some low-yield nuclear weapons aboard a strategic system, which is a strategic submarine, so that one of those tubes on a submarine would have aboard it a tactical nuclear weapon, small yield nuclear weapon, to use in a tactical contingency. And to fit all this capability, the one thing that we needed was something that would be better in the realm of what's called the B-61 bomb, which is the B-61 Mod 12. Here's why this is important and isn't just arcane nonsense. The whole idea here, for at least from some of our perspectives, with these nuclear weapons is as long as we have them, make them safe, make them secure, and make sure we don't use them. Right? And that's why there's a big push against making nuclear weapons more usable. So when the Russians are doing what they're doing, and Putin is saying, not only is all what I described in systems true, but we have a policy of escalate to de-escalate. We will, in a contingency where our country is threatened, we will use nuclear weapons first, first use, early in the conflict. And we will de-escalate the conflict because you will not join us in the use of nuclear weapons. So we will deter you from conventional force use and from nuclear weapons use. So what's our response? Remember state of nature? Our response is, oh yeah? That's very destabilizing what you did. So we'll meet your one and raise you one. We are going to deploy a whole range of nuclear weapons aboard a whole range of different systems so we can engage you at a low level 
where nuclear weapons use might be more acceptable in terms of yields. So if I said a few minutes ago, 15 kiloton, 10 kiloton, this is kiloton and maybe even subkiloton. But it's still a nuclear yield far greater than it can get from a conventional weapon. That's what we're doing. And we're saying explicitly, this is not for war fighting. This is not lower than the nuclear threshold. But what I want to argue to you, it is for war fighting, and it is to lower the nuclear threshold so that we can meet them at that level and deter them. There's a logic, a deterrent logic, to what the US is saying. It's not stupid. I, I believe it's risky, dangerous, and wrongheaded, but it's not stupid. It, in terms of the logic of deterrence, if they can do something we can't do, then you could argue one thing we might want to do is be able to do it too. But we'll call our doing it stabilizing. When they do it, it's destabilizing. There's an alternative to all this. And that's why Dan is here. <laughs> that's why I stop at this point. For me, I, I like the alternative. My career started in an agency called the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency. It doesn't exist anymore, but it did once. And I still like the idea of meeting security needs, ours and the international community's security needs, with arms control and disarmament agreements that limit destabilizing innovations and eventually get us to reductions, as much reduction as we can. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Well, lots to think about. Slightly depressing. Thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to hand over uh, to Dan Plesch, uh, who is the Director of the Centre of International Studies and Diplomacy here at SOAS. And that's built on a long career in academia and the non-governmental sector that's been integral to all sorts of conversations and processes that have contributed to international arms control and disarmament. So I'll hand you over to Dan now. Thank you. So uh, thank you so much, Bob, uh, for that presentation, for uh, if you want to uh, perch here, you can, uh, and for uh, joining uh, the committee for the strategic concept for the removal of arms and proliferation, along with uh, 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 almost an august uh, list of, of members, as yourself. Um, I see in the audience some uh, old friends and some uh, new ones and a good number of students. And uh, like uh, uh, a good priest, um, a powerful one text to take away for, for the student body, it would be uh, Hans Morgenthau, not what you usually get taught, but uh, Hans Morgenthau's final work of the 1960s, uh, A New Foreign Policy for the United States, uh, in which, uh, in contrast to everything he's argues earlier, and in contrast, therefore, to what you all get taught, uh, he... Uh, makes, as an IR theoretician, uh, much the same uh, argument and dilemma uh, as Bob, which uh, he says that nuclear weapons have indeed changed everything, that they mark a sea change in global politics, uh, unlike anything we've seen before, uh, and that uh, politics has, as he put it, uh, taken or chosen to deal with the wrong horn of the dilemma, it has chosen to try to integrate uh, nuclear weapons into uh, normal politics. And what we see in the latest rounds from the Trump administration uh, is a further example of that. Uh, he argues um, that societal change, attention to the United Nations, collective security organization, becomes a realist necessity. And why? Um, one can argue it in different ways. We st study civilizations at SOAS. Um, the famous uh, historian of ancient Greece, Thucydides, is quoted with respect to uh, the phrase of Thucydides' trap. Will a rising power, China, uh, get into uh, a war with an old power, the United States? But what the the opponents of any arms control, and there's plenty of reasons to be skeptical, would have us believe is that of any historical moment in the past as we get taught in, let us say, the Peloponnesian War, if you introduce nuclear weapons into the hands of all the people involved in the Peloponnese, that they would have been at peace and that never would have been a war since. But once you put it in those terms, you see this is our nonsense, that we have at least to have a trajectory of management 
and according to uh, countless speeches and agreements of an intent towards um, abolition. Now, in our project, we looked at these issues as, uh, as hard as we are able. And I think, again, in talking to uh, the student body some years ago, the whole the issues become uh, quite overwhelming. Uh, for the non-specialist, if they manage to keep up with the alphabet soup, and Bob was admirably restrained, but the alphabet soup of uh, uh, nuclear weapons, arms control agreements, and so forth, uh, it appears completely overwhelming. Uh, and yet, I, again, we'll try to put it in uh, as clear a terms as possible. Broadly speaking, there is agreement that we need to re-engineer the global economy to deal with climate chaos and global warming, global heating, as we now think of it. In comparison to re-engineering the global political economy to accommodate that phenomenon, the management of the world's weapon systems is, from a technical perspective, much simpler. Now, I emphasize from a technical perspective because, uh, obviously, politically, it is even more fraught than the issues to do with, with climate. These issues are much more of state politics and high power as, as we tend to, to think of them. But that isn't the way in which we're led to think about it. We're generally led to think that anything to do with weapons control is far too complicated and far too abstruse. And indeed, um, simple people like us need to be gently patted on the head and told it's all rather too complicated and we appreciate your morality and your sense of concern, but leave it to us, we'll, we'll sort it out. Uh, and indeed, uh, we see the consequences in what Bob has described to us. What we have sought to do in the, the Scrap Project is to describe a, a maximalist position of highly intrusive and effective verified weapons control. And in contrast to when I got into this business and Bob, Bob in a different way in the 19... Uh, 70s, uh, when any kind of hope of uh, control was really um, fantastical, we now have a, an extremely sophisticated uh, body of international practice, some of which has been allowed to decay, uh, some of which is still being used. And without uh, getting into uh, the whole uh, alphabet soup, we have produced a document on the website, um, which is here enough to frighten anybody with its weight, um, which is a compendium of the proven mechanism for weapons control as they have existed in the past. And these cover uh, nuclear weapons, and we have some affection for the system imposed on Iraq because it was by and large highly effective, highly intrusive, and for those who say we can't actually verify weapons of mass destruction, if one wanted to, here is a highly uh, effective system. And there are other specialist mechanisms that we can adopt. And even with the, uh, the breach of uh, the Chemical Weapons Convention and the, the uh, breaking of the taboo on chemical weapons by the Assad regime, still in large part there was a very significant effective uh, control and elimination of a large part of the Syrian stockpile at that time. So we have a range of mechanisms for the world's worst weapons that we could use if we wanted to. And despite the fact that they decay, again, if we're looking at uh, weapons that are doing the killing uh, today, and I'm delighted to have my colleague Martin Butcher from Oxfam, who has been instrumental in uh, the court case uh, at least temporarily preventing British government uh, arms uh, transfers to Saudi Arabia. But that, that treaty and um, the broader concept of control of conventional, just, just not nuclear weapons, is essential because of their widespread use in conflict. And unfortunately, uh, much of the ag political agenda we have today to do with, let us say, uh, small arms or landmines was based upon the romantic idea after the Cold War that we wouldn't have to worry about major war anymore. So we're faced with some efforts to deal with nuclear, some proven prototypes on weapons of mass destruction in general, and a growing problem of not just nuclear but conventional arms racing and conventional weapons use. 
Now, again, I shouldn't perhaps use the uh, word conventional. Winston Churchill, you can't have a talk in England without mentioning Winston Churchill, uh, in the atomic age was horrified that his American allies started to use the word conventional. He said, these weapons gave us World War II. How conventional you know, is that? Um, but these weapons at the moment have no a negotiating framework or proposal apart from ours in the NGO community for the control of major weapon systems. And yet, one of the mechanisms that brought an end to the Cold War were a set of East-West agreements which controlled and indeed um, spectacularly chopped up um, thousands of pieces of Army, Navy and Air, For uh, Army and Air Force weapons in the whole Euro-Atlantic area. Now, with the decline in politics, these agreements have been allowed to decay. But my point to you is, for a considerable period of time, these were effective mechanisms that gave Europeans, at least, and Russians for a while, the peace dividend, uh, and which, uh, to, to the delight of some of my students, specify that if you wish to destroy a, a tank, one way to do it is to get a wrecking ball and smash the turret off it. Another way is to take a missile and soar it into three meter pieces. This graphic description of arms control, nitty gritty verification. These are sets of procedures which we put into a format here linked to um, controls on weapons of mass destruction and including naval forces and said, well, actually, uh, diplomats, leaders, this is not a, uh, a moral concern. This is not, as with the nuclear ban treaty, a question where we're looking to have a, a new norm. Actually, we want global effective controls of all forms of weaponry, elimination of WMD, but controls of all forms of weaponry. And pretty much we know how to do it because, guys, you did it before. You just kind of forgot or, you know, if out of fashion. And this we put on the table in Geneva and other fora. And if you're interested uh, in the advocacy side, we would like you to come, and, to come and join us in taking this forward. Because it ought to be clear by now that while uh, uh, the nu nuclear developments and conventional developments have continued. Um, indeed, occasionally I get rung up by a journalist and they say, what's new? I said, well, not much is new. Uh, the weapons continue and we've had this build-up going on for decades, but occasionally you guys notice and ring us up. And Bob may have the, the same thought. Um, these dangers have been there, but international political dangers uh, political dangers are perhaps greater than they've ever been. The, the warnings from international organizations, if they're not heeded, keep, uh, keep coming. Uh, there are colleagues who uh, like to think we can make nuclear weapon states responsible. Well, here we have the United States, United Kingdom. Uh, are these any more? Can we say these are countries with responsible political leaderships, stable political systems? Uh, and these were absolute givens of the uh, uh, last uh, decades. And again, you put it into the context of Thucydides uh, and the ancients. It's perfectly clear, as with climate, that we have to get to grips. Now, what we bring to you are a set of proven prototypes and systems for the control of all uh, forms of weaponry at different levels, which changes the debate from one of uh, panic, one of confrontation with the uh, contrasting political competitions, one of a desperate attempt to understand uh, all the dozens of acronyms and concepts, to one where those of us who have been working on these issues for perhaps too much of our lives uh, would want to offer you a precision tool, a precision political demand to say, actually, get negotiating, on the scrap treaty. It doesn't mean we have to wait for everyone to agree to control everything, but it shows that a realistic benchmark is practical. And then we can look at different components. And we're told also, well, you mustn't rush. It's a step-by-step -step process. As Bob knows uh, far better than I from his experience, I was uh, an outsider at the time. Uh, in the late 1980s and 1990s, I know it's a very long time ago now, the major powers conducted multiple negotiations in parallel. They did nuclear weapons over here, 
they did smaller nuclear weapons over here, they did chemical weapons over here, and, uh, uh, and different components were dealt with in parallel. There were no linkages. No, no treaty was held up by another. But obviously, there were political connections. And if we look at the regional crises that concern us today in South Asia, in Northeast Asia, in the Middle East, in US-Russian bilateral relations, at the moment, there's no global context for this. You can talk to the Israelis and they say, well, why pick on us in the Middle East? Where is the global plan? You talk to people in other regions, similarly, they'll say, well, there's no overarching uh, project. Now, the UN Secretary General, for the first time, and we've been involved with him to a degree, has developed a comprehensive agenda in different components. But what we offer is a, uh, I wouldn't be so, perhaps so glib as to say one-stop shopping, but if you really want to see a way to get to grips with global armaments, provide a pull factor for other agreements, provide a context for what needs to happen in different regions, then that is something that we, uh, we offer today. And the arms trade treaty and the judgment in the British courts give an indication, perhaps even in this political environment, that we can look to um, <coughs> develop the rule of law. So I don't think we have to feel overwhelmed uh, or hope helpless in the cause of instability. And there are, I think, well, Putin's speech, other developments, there are... Um, Enough wake-up calls, and Bob, if I can retrieve that paper I gave you earlier, um, just to wave around, which is uh, out on the web, and uh, um, colleagues in Washington found it a day or two ago. This is just the 11th of June, um, a Pentagon doctrinal paper on nuclear operations. And frankly, for the first time, and you can say, well, the Russians are doing the same, and they should be admonished absolutely, but it's a wake-up call to the reality of political military thinking. And in the document, it specifies that, for example, nuclear weapons use should be integrated with the use of special operations forces. Now, quite why you want your men in the balaclava helmets and the you know, abseiling out of the helicopters to be integrated with nuclear weapons detonation, what kind of tactical scenario is it that you envisage? Well, they're pretty clear that nuclear weapons can be employed to um, influence opponents, um, to secure uh, good political outcomes for the United States, to secure strategic stability by using nuclear weapons in tactical, in regional, and in the global environment. And I'm sure there are uh, Russian um, counterparts, if not Chinese, to this, these documents. So when we think, well, it's all relatively stable in the end, that no one would really do it, the tragedy is that there are tens of thousands of um, personnel who will get documents like these coming down the command chain and will uh, learn and grow up and gain promotion by preparing to carry out these actions. And that is not a, a stable or safe world. And I think if you... Uh, perhaps are offered a choice between uh, the world of uh, uh, nuclear operations or a world of uh, the scrap treaty. At the very least, uh, perhaps we can use such uh, refined political military proposals on the control of weapons to hold back and change the political process that has brought us this uh, without, um, frankly, too much of a say-so. And those of us who are uh, in Europe, uh, I would uh, uh, ask that one perhaps takes both documents into the European Union and one takes both documents into NATO and the OSCE. And if we're engaged, I know some colleagues are here with the African Union, perhaps to consider uh, taking a document like this and putting it on the table with the European Union because the European Union is adept at lecturing Africa <laughs> on what it should do about its security and weapon systems. Uh, and perhaps they all also... Uh, should be brought to account. So, uh, as an old friend said, I should draw this to a close. And if you have been, thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Dan.
Thank you. Uh, that's uh, another fascinating um, talk. We're now going to have a five-minute inter-panel discussion. Um, and I'm going to start off by uh, just reflecting on some of the themes that have emerged from both your talks from my point of view. It seems to me you've both made a case for arms control and disarmament in different ways. Uh, Bob, you had this really fascinating historical broad perspective about the interplay between defence, deterrence, offensive escalation, and the one way to break that difficult cycle is to have safe disarmament. Whereas, uh, Dan, you were talking about the realist position uh, being uh, it being in nation's best interest to disarm safely, and then you presented a bulk of evidence about ways that it has and can be done in the future. So, bearing all that in mind, and bearing in mind what we know about the rollback from the, the uh, delicate balance of treaties that we've had, I wonder, do you have any feelings of optimism uh, or feelings of opportunity about where there might be possibilities for movement next? Yeah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so in the, in the world of optimism, let me tell you how much of an optimism optimist I am. I, I came in and I was disappointed that the room wasn't fr frigid as... You know, Dan had promised me it would be. And then I sat down and I looked over to my left and I saw the bottles. And to my eye, they looked a lot like absolute vodka bottles. <laughs> <laughs> and my heart absolutely soared. And I said, well, they don't have air conditioning, but they are making up for it. Uh, <laughs> yes. Anyway, so I would, it, it, with a, as we used to say on Long Island, where I come from, uh, a moment of curiosity here. Uh, I, Dan referred to IR theorists in international relations. I, I learned my IR theory from a professor by the name of Kenneth Waltz, um, who's famous as a structural realist, uh, maybe the structural realist. And I was his teaching assistant, and then he was my advisor on my PhD thesis. <clears throat> and so I don't come to this issue, um, the security issue, from a um, I would say a, a moralist perspective, though I like to think morality is not unknown to me, but it's not how I approach international politics. And so the way I want to start to answer, Henry, your, your, your question, your challenge here, is to say that I, uh, I am attracted at this moment in history, particularly, to scrap and to what Dan is talking about and proposing uh, and pursuing, because it seems to me, it, as I try to work towards it, sets out an alternative to one type of realist approach to the thinking that motivates governments now. And I was trying to say is that the thinking has varied quite a bit. And there's a difference, for, at least from my perspective, between the instinct of the Obama administration, which you heard at the when he went to Hiroshima, uh, and you heard at other moments, um, the Prague speech he gave, and the instinct that is captured in the NPR of 2018 for the United States. I think both were realists. Um, both were not naive about the international community, about the nature of international politics, about what the state of nature as a metaphor for international politics means. We're all responsible for our own security here. What it does not mean uh, is that one can lump every effort at managing, controlling, limiting, and indeed reducing armament as unrealistic. And indeed, if once you start thinking that, uh, that you, as we did when I think when we were moving towards arms control, particularly in the uh, mid to late 60s and 1970s, that it was a legitimate way of addressing the security dilemma which all countries face. The security dilemma is in quotes, it's a term of art in international politics. And arming is one way to respond to the security dilemma, but of course it leads to the other side, arming. And similarly, if you can manage reductions, it's, 
it's called disarmament and as a subset of the effort called arms control. What I'm getting to here in a, maybe a too long-winded way is that I sometimes worry that when you all and others look at scrap, you see something that is maybe morally virtuous, but, quote, unrealistic. And Dan was arguing, not so. And what I want to do as a card-carrying realist, I mean, I spent over 20 years working for the U.S. government. You can, you know, <laughs> I think you can see I'm not an ethicist. Uh, so I, I think what we're talking about here is another way of achieving your security objectives. You have to, it's going to be going to involve verification and monitoring and uh, transparency and all this other stuff that goes with arms control. But it's a far better way of dealing with the security dilemma. And while what Scrap does is two things. One, and, and, and I can't really talk in detail about this, but Dan will. You can disaggregate Scrap into pieces that have their separate virtue and make sense, particularly in terms of the history. But you can also put it all together if someone as, asks the question, as people do, uh, in my experience, well, okay, I understand you want New Start. I want New Start 2, right? I, I, I want there to be the follow-on. You can have one follow-on under the language of Start 1, of New Start 1. And, you know, well, where is this going? Well, if you, it's good to have Scrap to know where it all could go, but it doesn't have to. As I, when Dan and I were talking, I said, I don't want the best to be the enemy of the good. If I can't buy it all, can I buy pieces? He said, yes, you can buy. Well, what we've been doing is buying pieces over decades. And right now, we're selling pieces. <laughs> I want to start buying pieces again. I want to achieve legitimate security goals of states, ours, others, through means of control, negotiated control, and unilateral steps. We did a lot unilaterally. I was trying to point that out. Right? It's, unilaterally doesn't mean blindly. It means it's not a negotiated settlement. But negotiated settlements have their own virtues because they build momentum. I, I resist saying, Dan, they build trust. Because over 20 years of doing actually the politics, lots of negotiations in my background it, with... Iraqis and North Koreans and, and Serbs and others. I, I never really got much trust, uh, I think, out of any of this. But you got expectations. You got an understanding. You, you, you get things from negotiating that are of value as you move ahead. So I'm, uh, this is not an optimistic, pessimistic thing. This is a realist thing. I think um, that Dan and his colleagues are on to something, and I hope you think about it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dan. Well, I, yeah. I would concur. I would concur. I just would say to the wider audience here that the only thing, positive things that I've seen come about in this arena have come because there has been public uh, mobilization, such as we see nowadays about climate and that it's uh, the actions of members of the public or universities and so on who actually get this moving and bring it onto the agenda. So I think yes, that's my area of optimism and there are many pessimistic things to look at, but if we look at uh, some elections in uh, Denmark or people on the streets of Prague or in Hong Kong, we can see that it isn't all, uh, it isn't all bad news. And what we're trying to do here is to put a, a precision tool into people's hands and uh, we, you know, a lot of these agreements here uh, fell into something in 1990 called the Charter of Paris. I know like, the French like to throw a party for negotiations, and they had another one, which is the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. And we would like to offer this as a suggestion to the French or anybody else, is to have a third great Charter of Paris to start to, uh, to get to grips with global weapons. Uh, so that would be my points of... Uh, of optimism, and maybe we can open it up now. Right. Thanks, Henrietta. Yeah, thank you. So I'm, I'm pleased there are some moments of optimism. There's a sort of feeling that we can have an incremental, we don't have to have an all-embracing scrap treaty to have useful momentum, and the public 
mobilisation might really stimulate uh, some actions now. So now I'm going to open uh, the questions up to the floor. So if you put your hand up, if you have a question, and um, I'll ask you to say your name and where you're from first, please. Can we start with you, please? Hey, uh, my name's Adrian. I actually study architecture, so I've got my hands. Oh, we've got a microphone. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> But yeah, um, my name's Adrian. I study architecture at the Arts University Bournemouth, just working in London. Um, got a couple of weeks off. Well, uh, please to get see you here. Yeah. <laughs> more on your vacation time. I will be <laughs> Essentially, there, uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, that, thank you very much for the talk. So, um, what I wanted to ask, though, was maybe going in a more pessimistic way. Um, in the future, which nations or institutions, organisations, do we see actually acquiring nuclear weapons where they didn't have any before, if there's any chance of that happening? Shall I start? Yep. Uh, yep. So I, I think um, I, I should ta say that when I first went to government, we had something, it was politically incorrect, but there was a movie that referred to The Dirty Dozen was the movie. And there were about 12 what we called then threshold states. I think now, for those of us who were in that, particularly focused on the proliferation end of the problem, the horizontal proliferation as opposed to us and the Russians, vertical proliferation, um, there's one, I don't want to say only one quite, but there's one threshold state, and that's Iran. To the best of the knowledge of those of us in the United States, at least, Iran has no nuclear weapons. To the best of our knowledge, Iran had a very robust nuclear weapons development program. And when the JCPOA was being negotiated, the, one of the metrics that was used was time to weapon, time to first weapon. And we wanted to move it from one year out, two years, three years, four years, whatever. If you said, okay, I got Iran. <laughs> I've been following that. Well, North Korea is not a threshold state anymore. It probably has 30 or to 50 nuclear weapons. So if we looked around at other countries, countries that have in the past uh, been of concern to us, they were on that list. Egypt was on that list. Libya was on that list. Argentina, Brazil, Taiwan, South Korea, all were on the list. They're not anymore, to the best of my knowledge, of anybody's lists. We do talk about something else, and um, the IISS put out a, Mark Fitzpatrick actually, put out a, a piece on, on threshold states. States who, to the best of our knowledge, have no active nuclear weapons development program, but have capability. And the first country that comes to mind is Japan. And uh, Japan comes to mind not because we think, you know, that there's any enthusiasm among the Japanese public for nuclear weapons acquisition, uh, but because they have something that's sometimes called plutonium overhang. And that is tons and tons um, of plutonium. It takes, a, you know, five kilograms to make single weapon. So if you have tons of plutonium, you have a potential arsenal of nuclear weapons. All right, and then you'd ask, well, what do you need beyond the fissile material? Well, you need the triggering package. But does anybody doubt that Japan couldn't build something the United States built in 1945, could not build it right now, better, quicker, smaller, hum like a Honda? You know, I mean, so, so there's a great capability there. And uh, those of us who have been in this business don't want the Japanese to believe they need nuclear weapons. We want them to, s to achieve their security objectives in the context of the alliance with the United States. There are other countries that have accumulations of fissile material, but to the best of our knowledge, no intent. I guess that's the best I can do. Thank you. It's very clear. Yes. Do you have anything yeah, to add? That's fine. Um, right. Um, so I've had a, a question here, please. Yeah, there's Martin and there's Paul. Hey, uh, my name is Lyndon Burford. I'm a researcher at King's College London. Thanks very much for two excellent presentations, I thought. Ambassador Gallucci, your, your summary of the nuclear age was fascinating and concise and incisive. Uh, and thanks very much for this, um, Dan, what looks to be a, a really fascinating proposal to actually do something rather than just talking about these things. Um, 
with that in mind, I just was wondering if there's been any uh, discussion with the Swedish Foreign Ministry um, on June the 11th, the same day as that report actually, um, the Swedish Foreign Minister Mogo Wallström launched a 16-nation initiative to inject high-level political um, sort of momentum into the nuclear disarmament process. Uh, and that included states from around the world, NATO allies, non-aligned states, um, neutral states. So um, I just think they might perhaps be a really um, good audience for this type of thing. So has there been any discussion with that or would you be open to discussion around that? And I see there's a couple of colleagues here from BASIC who have been deeply involved in the process of working with the Swedish government on that. So they might also like to comment. Um, and then just secondly... Uh, a little piece of shameless self-promotion. I encourage you all to read a piece I published today uh, on the European Leadership Network on the idea of establishing a global commission on military nuclear risk in order to actually assess in a globally representative way what these specific risks are, and that might help you to do a little more targeted shopping as to what are the mechanisms that you want to use to address specific risks. So it's called a risk-driven approach to nuclear disarmament. Thank you. Well, uh, that one came. Uh, me, we've been talking to a, a lot of states. Uh, uh, a lot of states seem to be more worried about doing anything than about war <laughs> uh, in, in general and worried about their, uh, their relations. Um, I think the Swedish initiative is, uh, is an important one. Uh, but it remains the case that uh, there's no uh, proposal on the table from any state uh, for controls on uh, non-WMD systems. And as soon as you start that discussion, never mind the intricacies of treaty language, as some aficionados will know about this matter in non-proliferation, that uh, many states have regional concerns, security concerns, confidence building concerns, which a nuclear-only approach uh, doesn't uh, deal with and uh, I think it is a little perhaps sometimes difficult for people to take on a comprehensive approach but uh, David Owen uh, had some uh, who was on the work with the Swedish government in the 1980s uh, has been talking also with us to the, the Swedish government a year or two back um, but there remains a great deal of, uh, of caution and I think the uh, attempts almost to try and bridge uh, political divide between non-nuclear signing countries and the weapon states, such as the Swedish uh, initiative, are good, but they, I don't think, they answer the case. Um, as having got involved in these issues in the late 1970s for the first time, um, scrap offers, if you like, a, a, a dramatic uh, ban the bomb style, man landmines style, a uh, campaigning slogan. The uh, the acronym is not an accident. <laughs> um, Reagan uh, eventually decided he had to do something about arms control and his minders turned salt into start and they had momentum because they had start. So we started with what do we want? Well, we want to scrap the weapons and then work that back into um, a strategic concept. So I think we need something much more dramatic as a game changer that middle states, middle ranging states like Sweden can react to, um, and the deterioration of the international environment is so rapid and so dire that uh, intricate policy initiatives, such as I myself spend a lot of time on, um, aren't enough, and that we need something much uh, clearer and more far reaching. And having created basic. Back in uh, the mid 1980s, uh, perhaps we can team up again. Thank you. Um, so the next person on my list to ask a question is Martin Butcher. But I just wonder, assuming we've got Paul Ingram here and Basics been mentioned a couple of times, do you want to come in on this? Or uh, yeah, okay, in a minute. Thank you. Well, Martin, then, who's just here, if you want to pass the microphone down. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Martin Butcher and I'm uh, Oxfam's global lead on arms conflict and international humanitarian law. Um, I'd like to thank you, Ambassador Gallucci, first of all, for the presentation, which was very interesting, and also your words on optimism. Um, 
which bet between that and your, your reminder of the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency brought to mind the fact that when I moved to Washington, D.C. Um, to work with Dan and BASIC, um, the, the day I arrived, um, the first thing that happened straight off a plane was I, was I was dragged to the State Department for a rather drunken wake for the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency, which <laughs> turned out to be a very good evening indeed, although a sad one. Um, but in the face of events like that, optimism is really the only course. Um, Oxfam um, has been very pleased to support the development of the SCRAP initiative. Um, and I've put in some work with Dan and with the students on this um, and we'll be doing more in the future. Uh, the reason for, th for that, I mean, why would a humanitarian and development agency get involved in a massive global disarmament project after all? Um, the, the reason for that is we don't, we don't have a lot of choice. And the, 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 the South Africans in getting involved in championing um, the nuclear ban treaty um, stressed the, uh, the theft of resources. Um, from the poorest and most vulnerable people of, of the world going into um, armaments, nuclear weapons, but other arms as well. Um, in my job for Oxfam, I am daily working on appalling crises, um, which are entirely um, uh, human-made and mostly these days to do with conflict rather than... Um, uh, you know, climate driven or other crises although they, they, those obviously happen as well and then spark more conflicts um, and you know, o Oxfam has for the last 20 years been involved in arms control from the landmines treaty on notably the arms trade treaty um, uh, and other agreements um, because the, 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 the imperative is, is to stop the waste of resources and is to prevent the conflict which drives things like 65 to 70 million people being displaced from their homes, from their home countries, um, and to allow us to build towards um, you know, a better world through sustainable development goals that Oxfam also champions. Um, so I, uh, that's all exposition. That's a, a statement of support for scrap as much as anything else. Um, and uh, I, I guess to come back to the optimism point, my, if, if there's a question out of all of this, it's um, if, if, uh, if we move forward with this, you know, what optimism would you have that we can in any way succeed in the current environment? Let me start. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um. I think in small pieces rather than globally or I, I, to, I said to Dan earlier that it, it, if you did this mathematically I, I'm not and haven't been through those decades in government service a believer that you make important moves as a, like a step function it's a curve <laughs> and you want to look at the slope <laughs> of that curve rather than expecting a step function to to capture the movement. So I don't think we're going to leap to scrap in one move. Um, it's good to know where you're going <laughs> if you hope eventually to get there. But uh, along the way, there are going to be pieces. And uh, if you asked me, OK, uh, what are the next pieces, I, I, I could be optimistic that um, the United States could lead the way in the extension of New START. I could be optimistic that the United States representatives could get together with Russian representatives and find a way back into the INF Treaty. I, I mean, I remember this is what I did for a living for a long time, and I think this is all negotiable. Um, and I, I, by the human beings who are currently around, um, I'm, I'm not putting here, well, this person has to be elected or that person has to be elected. There's got to be a national decision, whoever makes that. But I think the, um, the international politics of those kinds of moves of, is, are very permissive. Uh, domestically, it really depends, and I don't particularly want to go there myself. 
but I don't think the I mean, because I think one when, when is tempted to say about you know the end game here that it's it's as Dan was saying it's not technical, it's political. I think those were among his his last words. Okay, and what I'm saying here, the politics of this don't require a global change to get to, and not even the ABM part, right? I mean, I, I uh, as far as I'm concerned, ballistic missile restraints, restraints on the systems that. Um, Putin talked about, and that was in the New York Times two days ago that the U.S. was pursuing these hypersonic glide vehicles, that restraints on all these things are quite politically plausible. These are not, I mean, there are things that are, are less plausible. I think global peace is not politically plausible as the next step. Uh, but I, what I'm saying is that you don't need that. You might want that. You might want a reduction in tensions. You might even believe that if you got what I was describing as technical steps on a slope of a curve, it would lead to a better relationship than we currently have. Yes. I could be optimistic about the little steps, though, just to get back to where we were. Right? So I'm, I don't, I mean, I, I don't see myself going into government again, but I teach at, you know, I, that's what I do for a living now. I teach graduate students and undergraduates. And I see my students as going in. A lot of them want to go into government service, notwithstanding reasons why they might not want to go into government service. And I want them to go into government service, and I want them to be optimistic, realistic, but optimistic about what they can accomplish. So I, I do have realistic optimism <laughs> about what can be achieved. Um, but you, have, you can't have that without understanding that not everybody not only doesn't share your optimism, but they don't share your goals, right? We have, and I will not talk about the government here, but I'll talk about my government. There are people in it who fundamentally oppose negotiated methods of, of reaching our security objectives. They do not like, believe in, I, I don't want to almost use the word trust. I don't, I don't trust either. I don't, international politics is not a place where I want to use the word trust. But they don't believe you can achieve your objectives through negotiation. So they oppose negotiated outcomes right? at the very highest levels of the U.S. government right now. And that wasn't true before. It happened. It's, it's, it's something that changes with elections. So re remember, as you go into this optimistically, that not only will you have people who aren't optimistic, but you'll have people who fundamentally don't like your goals. You got to deal with that. Thank you. I might... Dan, are you? Well, Do you have I, any optimism? <laughs> I think it's either optimism. Uh, well, the alternative is to kind of go off and be a, I don't know, a lap dancer, or a pole dancer, or a merchant banker, or you know, I mean, or get on with the job. Uh, so I'm optimistic and uh, want to get on with the job. I, I'm optimistic because when Martin and I started, uh, I remember. Uh, one of my early funders at BASIC um, gave me an incredibly hard time as to why I'd wasted $2,000 of a $10,000 grant on some obscure mechanism called the fax machine because uh, nobody else in no other groups in Washington had this uh, outrageous technology. Uh, and, of course, we were using it then to take documents such as this and fax them to uh, political actors in parliaments in Germany and so forth with, uh, uh, with great difficulty. And we would take... Uh, uh, documents in army kit bags and drag them uh, through airports to get any information uh, moving internationally. Now, the uh, communications is hugely more sophisticated. And, and I would, if there's any optimism, it would be I would hope that colleagues in BASIC and elsewhere would take this document and the nuclear policy uh, review uh, that uh, uh, Bob was talking about and uh, ask, uh, well, uh, U.S. forces in Germany, in Italy, um, nuclear weapons stations still in Turkey, are all now governed by this uh, notion that you could integrate uh, nuclear weapons with commando special forces operations. Is that something which applies in NATO? Is that something that applies in your parliament? Does your parliament approve that or not? Uh, does the European Union, uh, which is somewhat skittish on this getting into hard security issues, but without the British may have more room for manoeuvre. Does this also approve this? Will these facilities in uh, British or other allied countries 
uh, be permitted without parliamentary approval to carry out military operations against Iran or not? And I think those questions in allied governments are things that we used to do um, without the benefit of anything more than the first class airmail post, by and large. Uh, when I, and it is, I, I find desperately sad that in later life I find myself in similar debates. So my optimism is that with modern campaigning techniques and technology, we can actually deal with these sorts of problems much more rapidly and in a more sophisticated way than we did in the past. And we got some results then. Thank you. Uh, so next on my list is Paul Shorter at the front here. Uh, yeah, Paul There's a microphone coming, sorry, yeah. Uh, Grizzle Disillusion, former uh, Director of Arms Control in a small but perfectly formed nuclear state and uh, Disarmament Commissioner for Iraq. Um, and I agree, I, I'm very pleased with the scrap document. I think it's a useful compilation. I, I think that, that should be recognised and that, as a reference material, it, that's excellent. Um, I think it's important to draw the analytical distinction between the two things you've been talking about today. One is the sort of meta-history of... Russian-American arms, arms control and it's collapsed. That's a field where I think it is entirely conceivable you could have a sensible agreement between the two sides if only certain factions in each group would stop blocking it. That, but that's a different frame, thing from the, the huge vision of scrap um, uh, and, and the complications there. And, and, and so I think it's that we, we should distinguish between those when we discuss whatever it is we're here, we're here to discuss. But on scrap, I, I was impre impressed by the rhetorical flourish of holding up the two books there. Um, do you want this or do you want that? Um, but the trouble is, the, what will fixate most states is the possibility that they might be adhering to the white scrapbook while the other side is still using the black nuclear doctrine or chemical doctrine or, or armoured doctrine book. And they won't be able to do anything about it. They won't be able to disprove it. And I think a problem for, for, for this discussion is that you haven't looked at the wider international framework. I grew up, and I think uh, Frank did, in the in, the, in or just before the, the uh, post-Cold War honeymoon, where everything seemed possible. And what we have to accept is that we have faced 10 or 20 years of the collapse of rule-based international order, um, uh, post-truth society, <laughs> Uh, D David Miliband had a speech the other day about uh, the age of impunity, <coughs> where there is no accountability. He was writing about war, war crimes from, from an NGO <coughs> perspective. But that's where we're at. That isn't it. That's what we're having to face. That when we thought in the chemical field, which I particularly am interested in, we had an internationally legally binding agreement, the Hegelian stage moment, which was the Chemical Weapons Convention, we find in its first serious test, it breaks because the design problem of a partisan P5 member supported by an, another one is insuperable, and we don't seem to manage that. And we haven't, we haven't brought it into our discourse about, because it's unrespectable to mention how fundamental a challenge this is. But in the meanwhile, we go on talking about trust, when, when the accumulating evidence is we cannot manage these situations of acute distrust. And I suggest that that's, uh, it doesn't mean giving up hope, but let's, before becoming optimistic, let's try and acknowledge the depth and breadth of the problems which have to be overcome by optimism. And that loss of fundamental trust in, in good state behavior, including America, of course, in pulling out of the JCP away, but, but a lot more, I think, Russia and Ch China has been duplicitous. Uh, it, it's general and it's pervasive. And I don't see that your, your discussions evade it, and yet it has to be dealt with. Uh, I'm going to ask. Can I? Oh, sorry, <laughs> I was just I was just aware that that well, but I'm I'm aware through the conversation, Ambassador Gallucci's um, completely explicitly said he's not using the word trust, so this is going to be interesting. Well, I think yeah, yeah. Well, I think, I yeah. Think, yeah, I was saying, mm. but we both uh, yeah. disavow uh, trust and morality um, <laughs> <laughs> in favour of vodka if we can yeah. get it. Um, uh, Thank you. Yeah. I absolutely think it is not uh, uh, about minimising the problems you describe, but actually I think the recent actions by the Chemical Weapons Organisation to enhance its uh, inspection regimes are positive. I think actually that the uh, aged peace activist um, in Geneva 
former Soviet negotiator Batsanov, who introduced the idea of using uh, the Chemical Weapons Convention, was vital to global security. That if we'd had a war with a fully chemically armed Syria at that point, then the world in the Middle East would have been a hugely worse place than it is now. And the vast majority and the worst parts of the Syrian arsenal were disposed of under the treaty. Now, yes, horrible, disgusting, and illegal things have continued, and they breached the line, but they are not what we would have had without it. And that's where perhaps we, we differ on, on, the, on that case. Um, it is not, uh, I think, that I don't want to agree. Uh, there is a moment in the movie Dr. Strangelove when uh, the, the general uh, says, well, yes, of course we'll get through. Of course our weapons are great. Of course they'll get through. And then he has a moment of revelation, of course, that that means that he'll die that the war will happen. So yes, I could agree that it's all going to hell in a handbasket and everybody is evil, but the end of that, uh, and that we're the only good guys, but the end of that um, is an extremely pessimistic uh, realist outcome. And that in fact, we, we can uh, do a lot better because indeed uh, we have to. And I have a, uh, plenty more pessimism. I think there's probably prior agreement don't quote me, because that's what I think. It's speculation. And the journalists go, speculation, that's great. I'm speculating that there's prior agreement between the Polish government and John Bolton to forward base uh, INF missiles in Poland without any agreement with NATO, and possibly with other Central European countries who look more to Washington than to Brussels. Uh, I don't think the movements, the intellectuals, and the essay writers have at all got to grips with that coming at us this autumn. As a, uh, in a very few months' time. Uh, I think that a significant part of the American ideological elite uh, in the present government do believe in the rapture, literally. They do believe that you need to get all the Jews together um, in Israel, either convert them to, to Christianity or kill them, and then there will be um, the second coming of Christ. Uh, you hear, you look at that up on the internet, you'll find plenty that indicates that that ideology that you see played out in the American state houses is all too real in the belief system of some of the people approximating and close to the president. Now, I would like to think we lived in a much more sane and rational world than that. Uh, so those would be, be two examples why I could be a great deal uh, less optimistic than even perhaps you are, Paul. Uh, but nevertheless, we have to find a way through. And I'll shut up and let Bob get on with it. So I think you're right to observe that maybe I failed to draw a proper distinction between one type of arms control and another type of arms control. That there is a, I've always shunned multilateral diplomacy because I thought it was too hard and didn't work. And I, I liked bilateral. I liked dealing with North Koreans. I liked negotiating with Iraqis. I like negotiating with the Serbs. I like something by like because you get it done and it can be done, and uh, there are a lot of reasons. Howsoever, as we say, I, I don't think you're right about you know this works. Look at the arms control between us and the Soviets and then the Russians, and you you can conceive it and conceptualize it pretty easily. But as soon as you want to go to a broad multilateral treaty, particularly one which you dream of being universal in its scope. Well, not so fast. I want to say kind of both of them are in the same world to me of politics, and I'm going to go back to that, in a state of nature. So when you, bilaterally, you're not going to overcome the fact that the state is not, the other state's not going to do anything for which, which leaves its security dependent on trust. And it won't, that's not been our experience over a couple thousand years here with nation states. So. It's not going to happen multilaterally either. It might not happen multilaterally because the treaty is, com is a lot less binding. In, a, in other words, the political consequences of noncompliance are less. But therefore, the incentives for the other countries are also less. But they still have utility, and that's going to be my rejoinder to you. That if uh, those multilateral arrangements that I think have value have failed in individual cases, but they still have value. If you were teaching about to upcoming 
graduate students from all over the world, and you were going to say, how should you think about the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty? It's been around you know, for 70 years or so. Has it worked always? So let's see, let me count the number of countries that have cheated on the NPT in a way that mattered. Well, it, there's a bunch. Right? Is it still useful? You bet. Still requires full scope safeguards. Ah, what about the IAEA? Has anybody ever cheated on safeguards? Yes. Are they still valuable? Yes. Right? They, the, the NPT is virtually universal. That's 196 countries, I think, by last count. That's virtually all of them. They're, you know, they're a, a notable four that are not in. So I th what I'm saying to you here is that for the, for the move, move, the steps in scrap, for example, which is the example on the table, the individual steps don't have to be perfectly implemented to have value to put us on the slope headed in the right direction. But we all are going to be aware that we're in a world in which trust is not something that we will rely on for our security. We may rely on an, a, a real technical, as we do in the, in the States, assessment of the degree of transparency we can achieve through verification and monitoring methods right? and say, okay, I think I can detect significant cheating in a timely way. That doesn't sound like a lot of trust to me, but that's how we actually think. And I, for me, the fact that um, th there is a CTBT, which the United States does not belong to, and there are some other test ban treaties in those cases a long time ago, all right, it's not universal. Is it good? Yes. Is it good if a country adheres to it? Yes. Is it, is it a lock that they'll never test it? No. It's good. It, it adds to something. If you, have a, if you have a robust view of how states decide to do things, then these international arrangements contribute to one view of what motivates governments. Right? They, they will reluctantly, in some cases at least, violate the treaty. So I think, in other words, this puts us in, in headed in the right direction. If I was communicating that I thought these were more than that, I apologize and want to fix that. I'm, a, again, a realist, and I, uh, uh, states will, you know, will always want to look at the capacity of your potential enemy, not just his intentions, his capabilities. I, I taught for three years at the National War College. If you don't think that is emblazoned on the eyelids of the American military officer, you know, you know, look at intentions, but count capabilities. That's the way we look at it. And and the treaties you're talking about are different than bilateral treaties, and I should have made that point. But they go to intentions, and they help us assess them. They are not the same as capabilities, although they may impact capabilities in terms of what people actually acquire, deploy, or give up. So it's a moderate acknowledgment of the point, but also kind of a pushback I'd like on, on whether it's a killer point or not. Thank you. Um, good question. It got us all going. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, next on my list is uh, Rob for size in the middle here. Um, I have, um, Rob is one of seven questions um, and we're at uh, 2.35, so I'm going to invite everybody to be very uh, succinct. <laughs> thank you. So, Rob here, yeah. Good afternoon. Can I introduce myself? Uh, Robert Forsyth, uh, former submarine commander, uh, submarine captain, and I took Polaris to sea in the 70s, so a bit of an ancient mariner. A recent uh, convert, perhaps, from my youth when mutually assured destruction was assured and we all believed in it. Not quite so sure now, but it was the fashion at the time. Now we have sub-strategic, flexible response as our policy, which the government says keeps us safe uh, and uh, doesn't. Sub-strategic being uh, a substitute for not strategic, but probably tactical. Flexible response being something that can embrace everything, including perhaps a first strike with a low-yield weapon as a warning shot across the bow into troops deployed overseas. So the government doesn't speak truth, certainly to the services, because I was in them, and doesn't speak truth to the public. 
And I think one of the problems that I sense here, and I've sensed on a broader front, I now have, and I've only really seriously been approaching this problem for the last three, four, five years, I probably have 100 people on the list who are all very authoritative, but they all speak with a single voice. Today, there's at least three initiatives being discussed in accepting the uh, treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons, scrap the uh, uh, risk-driven approach by kings, and uh, basic with its discussions with Sweden. It's all very diverse. I feel that actually you need more coming together, a bigger coordinated approach. And I also think you need to speak to the people. What you're actually doing is taking power away from government, and government doesn't like that. And in this country, certainly, it's convinced the people that nuclear weapons are good. It's a blanket, comfort blanket that keeps them safe. Somehow or other, you have to get the public behind you to understand why they should press the government to give up this power, which doesn't do what it says, and to get some facts on the table. But it's too diverse. You need to get a more coordinated approach. It was impressive that the World Court brought the 1996 advisory opinion together, and it's impressive that I can managed to get the treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons together. And I think there is a risk that this initiative, which is good, and the Swedish initiative and your initiative could just divert because governments are very good at dividing in order to conquer. Mm. So more a statement than a question. Thank you. Thank you, yes. Uh, would you like to respond to that, Dan? Well, uh, thanks, Bob, yeah. and it's been a pleasure working with you on uh, uh, our article together recently, uh, very brief, briefly, and if we're going to be brief, the panel should uh, set, a, set an example. Uh, I think some of these issues are complementary, but they do pervert, serve different um, functions. And I think if, if uh, I would say with respect to the ban treaty, the ban treaty is a norm. It doesn't attempt to have uh, verification teeth. And uh, what we're offering is that. And similarly, the ban treaty doesn't deal with uh, non-nuclear weapons at all and once you get into these discussions you see those come on the table so in that respect we would see ourselves as right as coming in parallel to the um the ban treaty and in that respect compared to the other ones you mentioned both the scrap approach and the ban treaty are formal ideas for negotiating text and indeed some language in the ban treaty comes from the scrap project thank you would you like to add anything? No. No. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, I've got two at the back now. Uh, if, if the microphone could go that way, please. Um, thank you for the presentation. My name is Aditi Mishra, and I'm a student of uh, Dr. Dan Plesh. So I'll start by quoting two lines from the latest document that came out of DOD. Um, this presidential document states that nuclear weapons are the foundation of our strategy to preserve peace and stability by deterring aggression against the United States. Um, I want you guys to throw some light on this mindset uh, behind such a statement at the beginning of, uh, this of uh, a document of this importance. Is there a tendency to view the rest of the world as an aggressor and thereby creating, <laughs> proliferating, sustaining a culture of suspicion, fear, and instability. Because even if we came down from 60,000 nuclear weapons, uh, reducing by 80%, there are still 12,000 just owned by the United States, considering nothing changed out there. So what is the mindset behind this kind of uh, thinking and strategy? Thank you. Thank you. That be one for you. Is it? I'll start off on this. Um, the sentence, A, doesn't surprise me. It actually doesn't even offend me, uh, which may horrify you. But having s claimed the mantle of a realist here and characterized the international system in a sort of classical 19th century way as a state of nature, and also observed that 
security people in the United States and elsewhere, I would say, bless you, tend to think about capabilities wholly apart from what else you may say about the rest of the world in terms of their intentions and are they all hostile. I'll get to whether they're hostile or not, but first let me see what they could do to me if they wanted to. Right? And so I will look at the capabilities of Russia now and I will observe they could incinerate us many times over. Oh, might I look at their intentions? Yes, but right now that of course doesn't make me very happy. But I'd look at capabilities. I'd look at the Chinese and I'd look at their capabilities. I would look at other places where the United States has interests, friends, allies, whether they be in Europe or whether they be in Northeast Asia or elsewhere, and I'd say, how can these countries be hurt? Who are potential enemies of these countries just in terms of capabilities? Now, it's not purely capabilities because when I'm assessing capabilities, I don't put France on the list of countries I'm worried about, right? or at least most of us don't, I, anyway. And, and, and nor do we put the UK there or other countries who are allies or close friends. But I'm essentially answering your question with, yes, that's how a security analyst in the United States will think of these things. Now, that, that person doesn't decide US foreign policy, but they'll have a big impact on US security policy. And there'll be moments when the foreign policy analyst will ask the security analyst, what can they do to us? <laughs> and there'll be an answer. And there'll be an answer in terms of our capability to defend and our capability to deter. And everything I'm saying about the United States, I believe, is true of Russia and China right now and virtually every other state on the planet that tries to mount its own defense, attend to its own security. It will either attempt to unilaterally have this capability or to rely on an ally whose interest, whose interest it is, is served by defending that state. I go back to the way analysts, whether they be IR theorists in the realist tradition or whether they be security people who are, in, uh, who are IR theorists in the security tradition, think about the international system. And it, it, it is very much the way you described it. There is, uh, I, you've seen me run the other way when somebody mentions trust. Because we are, I can imagine writing it in a speech, we're hoping to build trust with a series of agreements. Actually, not really. <laughs> we're hoping to build a better relationship, greater transparency. But when I use trust to describe a relationship with another human being, I mean trust. That person has my back. And certainly that person is not gonna stab me in the back. But we have a history international relations, United States, everybody at whatever age they are, are aware of, quote, the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. We know what it is to be surprise attacked. We believe we were surprise attacked on 9-11. We understand what that means. Our position is develop a defense, develop a deterrent. It doesn't mean other states don't look at us the same way. It almost guarantees they do. That's what it means to be in a state of nature. That's what it means to have a security dilemma. And all states in a state of na nature have a security dilemma. So it's an unhappy answer I give you, but it's the only one I know how to give you. Thank you. Well, thank you. It was very clear. Thank you. So we're getting a bit tight on time. So what I'm going to do is invite all the people that put their hands up to uh, take it in terms to give a comment, and people can respond. Uh, you, we can respond in one go. Um, so there was a chap in a checked shirt at the back. Uh, do you still want to make a, ask a question? Mm -hmm. Yes, so some, if the microphone can be going that way. And then uh, lining up, we have David Cullen here, um, Burgundy, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just referring to you. Uh, and there's a couple more coming up, but I'm gonna go in order that I've seen the hands. Um, uh, the woman here, and Paul Ingram, and then if we have time, we'll have these two at the end. Is that okay, thank you, out. yeah, yeah. So. Would you like to make a start, please? Um, and if you could keep it quick, that would be great. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank um, you. Good afternoon. My name is Hussein. I'm a student at Middlesex University, and I'm studying journalism and communications. 
I was going to ask if any of you were familiar with um, two things, which is the um, Stop the Arms Fair, Stop the Arms Fair, which is a coalition organization that's set, um, based in London, and the DSEI, which is the larg largest arms deal trade in the world. Normally, it's um, held in. Um, there's an event that goes on in September, and I was thinking if you might be able to have any ideas about it. Okay, thank you. The next person on my list is uh, David Cullen here, please. I'll, I'll talk without the microphone. Okay, thank you. Yeah, just a couple of, of points on your, your presentation and the impact of it will issue. Firstly, I, I, I'm not a Russian specialist, but I have heard a Russian specialist argue quite convincingly that Russia doesn't, in fact, have an F8 to de escalate strategy. So I would be interested to hear uh, what you were basing that on and whether they were wrong or you were. Um, and, and the other was, was more about the sort of Putin's array of, of fantastical and exciting and horrifying weapons. And you spoke quite persuasively about the history of Russia reacting to US aspirations for missile defence. And I think there's a risk of reacting to Putin's aspirations to have these capabilities rather than you know, treating them as they are, as, as aspirations and, and trying to de-escalate the level of concern that's, that's popping around. Thank you. Could you pass it to back, please? Thank you. I'm Faisal Yasin, a journalist based in Srinagar in Indian Administrator Kashmir. And uh, my question is to Mr. Gulochi that uh, I would like to, you talked about defense and deterrence, and I would like to know in that respect, like, how do you sell the idea of nuclear disarmament to a country like Pakistan, whose uh, airspace wa was recently violated on the pretext that they were harboring terrorists and there was a terrorist camp and then their uh, bombs were uh, 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 carried by the Indian state there. Uh, and when we came to know th th there was no such thing that th there were n uh, reports, there were no such reports that there were terrorist camps and all that. Uh, how are you going to sell this idea of nuclear disarmament to a country like Pakistan, which uh, in all uh, consequences saved, uh, uh, whose nuclear capability saved a large scale war because of having nuclear capability, they, they, they were able to deter India and a war was evaded. So for countries like so India or Pakistan. Can I just, thank you very much, that's been really uh, helpful. Could you pass the microphone back to this uh, woman here? Um, I'm sorry to rush you, uh, we're in, yeah, yeah uh, thank you. Hi, I'm Sophie McCormack from BASIC. Um, so I would just like to ask a question to you, Ambassador. So one thing that concerned me a little bit was when you spoke, you spoke of deterrence being the fallback policy for dealing with nuclear armed states such as Rus Russia, as well as the fallback policy for dealing with likely proliferating states like Iran and North Korea. So I just wanted to ask you to um, kind of expand on the logic behind that as to why the same policy is used for two very separate entities. Thank you. And if you could pass the microphone now down to Paul Ingram here. Thank you. Uh, thank you for bearing with this whistle stop. Uh, that's the lot on this list. Once you ask your question, then we'll see if there's time for the next lot. Yeah. Okay. Thank so uh, Paul Ingram, the director of BASIC for another few days at least. Um, and I want to begin by thanking Dan for several things. Uh, firstly, setting up BASIC in the first place and his, li li uh, his visionary leadership. Uh, secondly, for setting Scrap Up, because I think this is uh, an extraordinary contribution to the debate. Um, and, uh, and I want to apologise for any pain that he experiences by the direction that I take BASIC in, which is not the same thing that he does. Um, I, I'm surprised at this conversation about trust, because, you know, uh, the age-old enemy of this country, France, is a country that we're not going to be going to war with anytime soon. And uh, the European Union, uh, God bless its uh, um, painful situation right now, is still a, a continent of trust. So, I mean, there is trust in the international system. It takes time to build up, and it requires pe people and states to, ta to have a, a degree of, of uh, strategic empathy. And strategic empathy doesn't come about very quickly. Uh, but it's something we can build towards. And, and this comes, I guess, to my principal point and uh, invitation to respond to, which is we are dealing with a complex adaptive system uh, where nobody has the answers. Nobody, none of us. And the question, the question is, in a complex adaptive system, when, uh, when there are people who are controlling many different parts of the system and, and actually failing, 
uh, even the nuclear weapon states, um, how can we move into an engaged conversation, a dialogue with people with states uh, across the global community that we disagree with? Do we just simply present our answers or do we actually engage in an open dialogue where we recognise we don't have the answers, they don't, and we actually engage constructively? Thank you. So uh, we are running out of time, so I'm sorry that will be the end of the questions. And I'm sure if you were around for a bit, you might be able to ask the speakers uh, independently. Um, I'm going to invite each speaker to give some closing remarks and respond to all the questions uh, that they can. Um, can I start with you, Dan? Okay. Yeah, thank you. OK, well, many points here. Uh, we reached very effective uh, agreements with the Soviet Union when we didn't like them or trust them at all. And our cooperative security was hugely enhanced and global security was hugely enhanced and we didn't much care for the communists uh, and yet we managed to achieve that. Um, however unpleasant uh, uh, Putin is, he doesn't have a, a competitive ideology uh, as, such as communism and currently, uh, never mind Soviet power, the gross domestic product of Russia is about that of the Benelux countries. So quite why uh, we are so given the runaround and uh, are in so in awe, I don't quite know. So yes, I think we can uh, debate and deal with uh, countries that we profoundly disagree with. I think we do have to look, as they say in the Bible, at the, uh, the moat in our own eye or the beam in our own eye. Um, I fear that, um, you know, there's a controversy about moving the um, Andrew Jackson off of American Bill and putting a... Uh, an African American woman on well, Andrew Jackson is of course a you know a hero of a certain strand of American society, and for him he really didn't care about what to know the difference between the Cherokee and the Seminole and the Sioux because he was moving west, uh, and I fear that that ideology explains why uh, certain sections don't feel they need to know the difference between Shia and Sunni. Uh, they have a disposition of the of the world which is not a particularly uh, positive one. Um, I'll close, though, by saying that there is a, a fundamental misunderstanding in a lot of the way in which international relations is taught, but not in the way in which political leaders come to the United Nations. Um, uh, and it's this. It is it's, we live in an anarchical society in which there is no global government and no global discipline of states, and therefore things go on. The reality is that gradually since at least 1815 but certainly since world war one that the self-destructive potential of civilization has become the growing and now becomes the dominant feature in international society how do we deal with the self-destructive potential of industrial society we see it tackled in climate and environmental issues it also exists in the military sphere it came to the fore first of all in the military sphere out of two world wars and the bomb and this acts as a disciplining factor on states because the whole point of the disciplining factor is that in the, in the nature of, of a, a global policeman is that if you get it wrong, you get punished. And therefore, you have to moderate your behavior because you might be punished. That's the whole point of the Hobbesian world. And the reality is with the bomb is if we get the bomb wrong, if we get war wrong again, we all get punished. And that is why in rational systems, as we saw during the later Cold War and beyond, we see uh, this competition between old style uh, reality, pre-atomic reality and post-atomic reality, what I call Einstein realism, which is actually there is a real driver to cooperation, which is if we get it wrong, we will get disciplined. And that you see in the behavior of states, you see it in what leaders say at, uh, at the UN, but it is a continuing tension. And that is the challenge that we have to face. Thank you. Um, Ambassador Gallucci, do you want to close? Yeah, I thank do. you. <coughs> I have uh, four questions I want to respond to <laughs> Great. quickly and briefly. Okay. First, David's, it, David challenged me with a, at the end of your question, you said to either your colleague was right or you are right, which? I'm right, he's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> she. Well, she's still wrong. But let me say that 
Uh, you don't need to rely on my, of course, extremely objective response. You can uh, Google this yourself. Uh, there's a good piece that was done in arms control today it, with lots of citations and explanation of how the Russians came to escalate to de-escalate and citing open literature. And I can tell you this much on a classified basis that it's our, our, our view of that policy, particularly in the early 2000s, was, was, the policy was quite robust and reflected in a lot of different places in the literature, but also unclassified. So there's no question that it was a declaratory part of their policy. What you might say is, what's the policy now? Because um, th this was embraced as a method of dealing with an asymmetric conventional disadvantage that the Russians perceived from the 90s, and they needed some way to secure their borders against the loss of the buffer of states, which some of which had joined NATO, and the robust character of the United States' capability to project force. Anyway, what I would say is, no question that's there. The question is, well, what are they doing now? Do they still talk about this? They do not. And when I accused the Russian ambassador over a very nice luncheon in, in Washington that, you know, this was an annoying policy, escalate to de-escalate, he said, it's not our policy. He didn't say anymore, but he could, that's what he should have said. So right now, I don't think it's a declaratory element of their policy, but it sure as hell was. And the worst part is what I talked about, and that is the development of lots of systems to operate at lower yields in order to get to use nuclear weapons without getting into um, high kiloton yields. Okay, um, how do we deal with Pakistan and disarmament? Uh, well, I, 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 I have sympathy for the Pakistani security dilemma, not because Pakistan is right and India is wrong, not be, because Pakistan is home to terrorist operations against India a lot, right? India is not innocent either, and uh, uh, at least New Delhi, and probably not Islamabad, are not interested in having the United States or anyone else come in and help them solve this security dilemma. Uh, all I would say is the U.S. perspective on this uh, is that, or as one of our perspectives, is that yes, Pakistan has an asymmetric conventional force disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis India and always will. Um, but its method of dealing with this repeats the mistakes of the Soviet Union and the United States over decades of building up a robust nuclear weapons capability with a diversified group of delivery systems so that they can operate at lower levels and engage right away, be credible, and therefore, as being credible, have a more effective deterrent. For our perspective, they're much more likely to get into a nuclear war by building and deploying the systems they are. We would argue for them and their security that they would be better served by arms control to talk to the Indians about deployment, transparency, and other things of which there's a lot of literature where the U.S. and other countries have gone through it, some with success and some not so much. But my answer is that the, that the Pakistani answer and the Indian response is essentially an arms race and doesn't serve their interest. That's how an American strategist might look at that. With respect to the, the question on why would the United States or why would I, I guess more precisely, look at Iran and North Korea the same way we would look at Russia and presume to deal with them through deterrence. Well, we only would to the extent we can't deal with them through defense. And while we have some capability to deal with um, ballistic missiles that are of intermediate range and certainly short range, we do have systems that, can, that will engage those kinds of targets. We do not have systems that with any confidence can engage ICBM at the re, an ICBM warhead at coming in at those reentry speeds. So, therefore, um, we talk about, in the Iranian case, not so much deterrence now because Iran does not have any nuclear weapons to the best of our knowledge. Its ballistic missiles are coming along and we're talking about deploying to deal with them, but we can mount a defense against Iran and for most s scenarios. And so we don't talk so much about deterrence unless they were to become a nuclear weapon state. North Korea has moved into a gray area announcing, the chairman did, and 
January of 2017, that he would, North Korea, the DPRK, would develop an ICBM capability that would directly threaten continental United States. All right. Maybe on the first day of that capability, we could mount a defense. So if we knew when they were attacking, if we were, there were no decoys mixed in, if we knew pretty much the trajectories we were going to be attacked by, we might be able to shoot down incoming RVs. But on day two and day 50, not so much. So we don't really have a defense against a, even a developed North Korean capability to deliver ICBMs against the continental United States. So I, for one, am an advocate of deterrence for dealing with North Korea because the alternative is defense or preemption. And we don't have a defense. And we not, ain't going to get one anytime soon. That leaves preemption. And I do not like American preemptive acts. Right? So deterrence fits with containment and meets my needs for the security of my family and my country. And it doesn't involve us killing any North Koreans, so I like it better than, than any other of the options that are available. Um, finally. We're, we're technically out of time. so if you This is a see. short answer. Yeah, great. Thank you. <laughs> on, on the question of trust, I should say that the question of trust, the way I have treated it, goes to self-interest. When it is in our self-interest to trust, as in an ally, we do. When it's not in our self-interest, we do not. States act in their own self-interest. That's what I should really say. <laughs> okay. Well, what a fascinating conversation. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Thank you to both our speakers. Thank you for Fadil for organising this. Um, very quickly winding up, there's been all sorts of comments relating to whether we can be optimistic or pessimistic at the current time in the, in, when we're thinking about nuclear war and peace in the age of Trump. Um, but more tangibly, I think there's all sorts of reasons to stay positive about the possibilities of arms control and disarmament whilst recognising their very, their, their very real challenges at the moment. Um, things that have been mentioned are we simply don't have any other option, Martin Butcher said. Um, there's evidence from scrap of, of achievements that have been made in the past at moments of significant antagonism. Um, Bob was saying that it's technically possible, but also it's politically not implausible. <laughs> might not be easy, um, and they still have value and utility. Even if parts of them are broken, it's still worth trying to uh, get better agreements. So thank you again, everybody, for coming, and if we could just give a clap to everybody for being here. Thank you very much. <laughs>